Gear, 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 gear. All right, another gear video. 23, 24, winter. Uh, made some pretty big changes this year. But before we jump into it, I have a few other gear videos. I won't be repeating the gear I've talked about there before, like the Anima or the Atris, uh, all that stuff. So I'll reference that and you can go watch that in the other vid if you wanna jump back to it. And also like this is the gear that I use for my skiing. So it's not necessarily the gear that you'd want for your skiing. You know, if you went into a shop and say you wanna buy a pair of black rose, for example, I would bet like if you're touring in pretty much all over Europe, they're gonna say, hey, buy the Comox Freebird because that's an amazing ski for most people for ski touring. But for the kind of ski touring that I'm doing, maybe not the best ski. So bear in mind when I'm talking about this gear, it's for my skiing and the sort of skiing that I do at the places that I do it and the way that I like to do it. But that being said, there's some goodies. And normally like I always start out with, you know, the safety gear, the avalanche kit, all that, still important, but that's not what gets us excited to ski. It is of course the ski and the ski that I'm most excited about right now is the Draco Freebird. This thing is pretty amazing and I'm extremely stoked about this ski. So yeah, I mean the skiing that I do or the skiing that I strive to do, that I wanna do is like, you know, big mountain skiing, far away from roads, from people, big lines where I can ski fast, do airs, have fun and do whatever possible in sort of like this backcountry environment. But because, you know, the past four, four years, four or five years, I've tried to do this like low emission skiing. So that's reduced my access to helicopters, to snowmobiles, all these tools that you normally use for backcountry skiing at, you know, trying to do it at a high level. Cut that off the menu for now, still waiting on that electric helicopter. But for now I'm hiking, I'm walking human powered and you know, it's, it's big days, you know, like for this last film I did with Sam uh, Favre, we had three days in a row of touring, you know, a thousand vertical meters up, 10 kilometers in, up these glacier plateaus just to get to the bottom of our lines. And you know, from there we're climbing up to, you know, a four or 500 meter face that we want to ski. And then you get to the top. <laughs> And then when you're up top, I want to ski fast. I don't want to think about the fact that I'm on touring gear. I want to ski this space as if I was dropped on the top by a helicopter. So this puts certain requirements to the gear, something that's easy to go uphill with, but also really performs on the downhill. And for me, I've always had this struggle between, do I choose the Atris, which is a lighter ski, it's like around two kilos, but it's 105. It's not the biggest, burliest ski. Or, you know, the Anima, it's half a kilo heavier, 194, uh, 115 millimeter underfoot. It's an amazing big mountain uh, ski. And, you know, to charge big lines, you know, I have full confidence in a ski like this, but I would always be in this position, like, do I choose the lighter ski or do I go with something that's heavier and it's gonna wear me out on the way up? Now, after years of nagging, finally, Julian Renier, the legend, the man, the myth, he put his uh, genius uh, mind to work and came up with uh, the Draco Freebird, the first you know, high performance, big mountain touring ski from Black Rose. And it weighs the same as the Atris. It's like just under two kilos, but I would say it performs very similarly to the Anima. Of course, not exactly the same. There's some key differences. And I'll go through just like, what this ski is and then you understand where it sort of fits in between these, these other two skis. So this is a big mountain free ride touring ski. It's uh, 189.2 and the longest length, uh, 112 millimeters in, in that same length, the one I ride and 23 meter radius. This isn't constant between the, the length. So I rode the 181 for a photo shoot, which is the 110 and also a shorter radius. I mean, it's not a completely different ski, but it's way more playful, it skis a little bit differently. So it, the ski kind of changes through the sizes. It is a long radius ski. It's super stable at high speeds. Okay, hang on. Oh my gosh. It has a, a double rocker profile. So you have camber underfoot, uh, and then you have a rocker in the tail and the rocker in the nose. I find this super important. A lot of people ask me like, why would you want a twin tip in a backcountry touring ski? And I'm mean, like, yeah, sure. I don't ski switch that often. Sometimes I do. I want to do my annual cab five when I'm out there. But also really like that tail rocker because one of like the, the principal things that I'm looking for in a big mountain ski is how 
predictable it is when you're going at very high speeds and then you turn it sideways. Like I don't want that edge to like catch at all. I want like a very, very smooth transition so that when I'm going at high speeds, I can break or like dump speed as I please. It has a pretty solid flex. It's like, this tail feels solid for sure. Actually, when I first got on the prototype, I felt like the tail was like so stiff that I mounted them one centimeter back from recommended. Now I ride them on recommended. That's five centimeters behind true center. So it's a little bit more aggressive than say the Anima at minus six or the Atris recommended is actually minus eight. So I've been pushing that a bit forward. But for sure, like that tail when I first got on it, I was like, wow, this is, this is burly. And it is, and it really helps for taking landings. For when you're going at high speeds, you, wanna, you really feel confident. So it has all those characteristics of, you know, a classic big mountain, hard charging ski. It floats well, it's wide enough for that, but also has these more touring specific features. So the steel edges are a little bit thinner than what you find in the big mountain range to shed weight. The core is also a little bit lighter to save weight. You know, this is the same weight as the Atris, but has more surface area and is stiffer. Also has a non-stick top sheet, so that snow doesn't stick to it as much. I mean, snow will always stick to your top sheet given the right conditions. Take a hot ski into cold snow, gonna get snow to stick on that thing, no matter what. But it works pretty well, actually. And also, and this is actually a huge bonus and something that annoys me all the time when you're on the skin track and your skins start coming off, it is set up for skins. So you have a clip in the nose and in the tail for skins. So I've I still, like I've skied this now for, oh, yeah, close to a year and I've still to lose the skin. So the skin clips up in the front and also in the back. So yeah, there's no way for the skin to come off. And you actually save a little bit of weight on the skin too with not having that huge metal buckle that you have on most skins to go over the, the tip. So yeah, I'm pretty stoked about that. The skins are Pomoka. Produced for Black Rose, Pomoka is Swiss. They are amazing, actually. I'm really happy with them. They glide really well and the glue has been super good so far. Yeah, nothing bad to say about that, really. I'm hyped, hyped on the skins. You are making a few compromises to save weight. So like on the Atris, on the Anima, they are heavier, they are more damp, they're more maneuverable with the shorter radius. You know, this is only a 19 meter radius, so it's quicker edge to edge. It's not as serious. Why so serious? If you're going resort, big mountain riding, I would definitely go Atris or Anima still. And I'm very stoked to go resort, big mountain riding. Whereas if I'm going for all the backcountry touring skiing, I will definitely go with the Draco. It is my new baby and I love it a lot. Beautiful, beautiful ski. Before we go super wide, we gotta go super skinny. The Black Rose Mentis Freebird. This is the smallest ski that I've been on since I quit snowblading. I guess you never quit snowblading. I'm taking a little break from snowblading. I'm actually doing a lot of training this year for a movie project that I'll get back to. So a bunch of that training entails skinning with as little weight as possible to just get a lot of uh, vert in. And uh, this uh, Mentis Freebird has been my ski of, uh, of choice. It's less than a kilo, super lightweight, but still pretty stiff. 19 meter radius, just like the Anima, just like the Nocta. I don't know, I think Julian likes 19 meter radiuses because he gives it to all his skis. So yeah, I guess that's a sweet spot. You want 19 meter radius. Has a little bit of rocker in the nose, 80 millimeter underfoot. I ride it in a 178, that's the longest length. It's not a hard charging ski, like the main goal of this ski is to have a minimal weight uh, on the uphill uh, for efficient uh, ski touring and it does that really well. It is, it is still pretty fun to ski it, like you can do turns and I've done some butters and, and I mean, it's a ski, it skis, but it's for sure not something you go uh, charging with. But if you're going on like a huge big day, you know, like a four or 5,000 vert day, or you're just training, it's a really good tool. And it skis really well for what it is. I've mounted them up with the ATK Revolution. I have switched uh, binding sponsors this year. I didn't primarily do it for this Revolution Race binding, but it's pretty good. It has my name on it. They have lasers at the factory. That's good, it weighs 100, uh, just over 100 grams, I think, 105 grams or something. And it's, yeah, super lightweight, been durable so far. Had no issues with it. Classic construction for like a lightweight race uh, ski touring binding. 
really happy with it. Also, of course, comes with Pomoka skins. So if you're into spandex, into fast touring, or if you just become a dad and you're on the dad program, this is your ski. And now on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the Nocta. This is the fattest ski in the Black Crows range. It has been for, well, for many years since Julian Renier joined the team. If you don't know Julian Renier, he is a legend of the ski world. He was a founding member of Armada. He made the first ski with rocker in the tip and tail and camber underfoot, the, the JJ back in the day. He uh, got kicked off the team, took all his knowledge over to Black Rose, where he has been making the most amazing skis for, um, for a long, long time now. The first ski he ever made for Black Rose was the Nocta. I'm not sure of the exact dimensions of that first one. This was before, before my time. The goal of this ski is sort of like deep powder, tree skiing, and it's always been, you know, a little bit more maneuverable, a little bit more playful than a ski like the Anima. It's, it's a powder ski for all that. And you can tell, I mean, it's that 122 underfoot, longest length, 190. Uh, still a 90 meter radius and a lot of rocker, uh, both tip and tail. It came out last year actually in a limited edition, but I didn't get to ski it till this, uh, just this past two weeks actually. Uh, and it's so fun. Ah! Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing ski. It pivots so fast has amazing float, easy to land switch with the big tail. Just really, really, really fun. And I mounted this unrecommended with the ATK Freerider 15 Evo, which is amazing. <laughs> ATK, they're from uh, Italy, from Modena. They're like the next factory over from the Ferrari factory. And although, of course, I prefer Polestar's, Ferrari is also quality. The history of the company is actually, they used to manufacture parts for like that you know, high-end Italian uh, auto industry for these fancy Italian cars. But then they got into schema racing and they were like, wow, there's room here for improvement. The, the patent went up for the original manufacturers of the pin bindings and anyone could make their own versions. And the guys at ATK, they were like, let's see what we can do with this. And what they've done is, it's really incredible. I went down to the factory this summer to see their operations, see how they work. I'm in Italy where it's all made. Just like the attention to detail is crazy. I mean, like the specs themselves, let's just like start off with that. Like this is a DIN 15 binding that weighs, depending on like which add-ons you use, but it weighs between 370 and 390 grams, which is like miles beyond any of the competition, just in terms of weight. Good work, Davide. And they're able to do this because they have all this like high precision Machinery. This is the secret area. We can't we can't film in here. So they CNC mill all these parts from solid chunks of aluminum right at the factory. And the precision they can get from this is amazing. So it's actually the first toe piece with a den that I've ever skied from on a pin binding. And I know I'll see the criticism. I understand what's coming in the comments. It used to be G3, it used to be Dinofit. I had all these good things to say about those toe pieces too. And I mean, those two pieces were amazing as well. I didn't really have any problems with them. And I mean, my first tech binding I skied was like a plum guide in 2012. And I feel like they've all worked, but this is just like the best since then. Like this is compared to the, the iron that I used to ski, which is a DIN 12 binding with lots of plastic, that was 600 grams. So this is like 33% lighter with a way higher DIN on a way more solid construction. One of the first things you'll notice is this cam system in the heel piece. When you step into it, it's, um, it's really smooth. Like it, um, it feels less rigid than stepping into a normal uh, heel piece. Flip it, push down, and now you're into touring mode. And then you're on the uphill, you can of course lock it. It has different modes for how tight this is. So you can adjust the tightness of the toe piece from soft, medium, and hard. So if there is wear and tear throughout the life of the binding, you know, I've had some issues with other bindings actually where it be it's become too uh, soft, so it doesn't lock properly, and then you can kick it off on like an icy traverse. But with this, you can adjust that so it always stays tight, which is pretty rad. Another thing is, and this is like one of the most classic uh, problems with a pin binding, is icing underneath the toe piece. 
So on all my pin bindings in the past, up until this binding, I always had to be really, really careful with icing underneath the toe piece because you'd get icing under there and then it wouldn't really lock properly. But they're so precise in the manufacturing of this Evo 15 that there's just no way snow can get in there. So it's so tight actually that you just, you're not gonna get any icing there because the snow can't get in, which is nice. And it's funny because I saw Hoji on the Blister Summit and he was talking about, here's the reason everyone's having pre-releases. I've seen many, many times, already several times this year, any snow that goes under that toe piece gets put under enormous pressure and becomes this ice block and like blocking the binding from closing properly. The reason is now gone. Also, one thing a lot of people complain about when riding pin bindings is that they feel like their heel is slipping a little bit because you're not actually pushing down on the ski itself. You're pushing down on these tiny pins. On this Freerider 15, you have these free ride spacers. So you're actually pushing down on the ski itself with your heel uh, of your ski boot. And then of course, these can slide so that they still release like they should with the sideways release. Also got heel risers, super easy to use with your pole. Also, and this is like, maybe it's marketing mamba jumbo, I'm not sure. However, uh, they also say that the springs in the whole system are rigged so that all those little micro vibrations that you will feel in a pin binding, you know, in riding over icy terrain, chandari stuff, all that stuff, they're rigged so that the springs won't release with those vibrations. Like you need a big solid force onto the springs like you would have in a crash for a release to happen. I've still had no pre-releases and I've ridden riding them unlocked, of course. I was going through a phase last season of like trying to go to super light bindings, like 150 gram bindings on a big free ride ski. And I found a limit of where that works, doing like a five meter air landing, ski just coming off, as you would expect riding a 150 gram binding on a big free ride ski. And that's the reason you don't ski on 150 gram touring bindings. <laughs> And then of course, the solution there would be to just lock the binding. Because then you'd have like a DIN 30, I think, if you lock the bindings. But then if you crash, your knees are fucked. Part of the reason like I go to something like this now is because I can have a DIN 15, which is a reliable DIN 15, where I can ride this unlocked, feel confident about it, uh, but also feel confident that my knees won't break. Yeah, so it's super cool and I'm, I'm really, really excited about them and you just feel like the craftsmanship in these bindings and I'm not going to show you now but if you paid attention you might have noticed like some different parts that are different from these to the, what you can get in the store now because their product development is insane. Davide and his uh, dad, uh, the guy who own, owned the factory, they're just constantly tweaking the bindings, coming up with new new ideas and they have like their lineup is insane. They have so many different bindings because they're always coming up with new parts, new ways to do it. And I got these bindings when I visited in July and they've already sent me parts that they're replacing because they're better or lighter or stronger. So it's this constant process of improving the gear, which is really cool. And I mean, of course, some commercial mindedness, they're sponsoring me, for example, but that's not the focus. Like their one focus is making the highest performing gear. But then also what I noticed when I visited them, and I didn't know this from before, but they're also really, really focused on sustainability. Their factory now is producing almost as much energy as it consumes. They're building a new factory that'll be producing more energy that they consume. It'll be done in 2025. And also because all the parts or so much of the binding is aluminum, it's produced with, you know, from these solid blocks, they can all buy it like fairly locally, locally grown aluminum. One process that illustrates it really well is like you, you cut these out from solid blocks aluminum, you have all these cutoffs. So these are the tips coming out from the machine. That has all this uh, lube uh, from the CNC milling still, you know, among the cutoffs. So you can't melt that down and make new bindings from it right away. So what they do is they squeeze out the lube. And this makes the aluminum ready to recycle without any chemical washing. So this gives a lot of, it's really sustainable. So that they can reuse both the aluminum and the lube after. So it's pretty cool. It's like a commitment to make insanely good gear, but also do that in the most sustainable way possible. I'm hyped, excited. All right, this is actually often a piece of gear 
people don't think about, but poles are important unless you are Pep Fuges in idea. I gotta say, Eric Pollard gave Pep some shit for that part in the Vice documentary. I think Pep had a thing going. I was riding the Hellbends back then, trying to no pole. But now I'm not going no poles as much. I am not Dylan Siggers. I uh, like poles. Poles are, you know, practical for pushing around the ski resort, for pushing around the mountain, for hiking uphill. I love this. This is the Duos pole from Black Rose. I use this for everything. Having the ability to... Whoa. <laughs> Whoopsie. <laughs> blooper section. Having the ability to extend and adjust uh, my pole is this is really nice. I've gone from riding a 115. I used to ski park when I was a kid. Now I'm up to 125 when I want to do more like hop turns and actually just having a longer pole to push if you're on like a flat section at a European resort or if you're ski touring through the woods. Uh, I love that. I don't understand why people don't get uh, extendable poles. This is the way to go because you get the best of both worlds. And I don't find like there is any compromise to having that um, myself. So I use this for all my skiing, even my park skiing. It has a, a long grip. This is super nice for when you're on the skin track and you have one pole higher than the other, uphill pole, downhill pole. Also a benefit of having a grip like this with no big, huge, clunky plastic thing up top is that I use this as sort of like my first level climbing tool when in the backcountry. So like before the ice axe comes out, I'll be using my pole upside down, punching it into the snow and with this metal tip um, and no big plastic thing to make it not go into the snow. It actually works super well as like the back end of an ice axe. And then you have sort of levels to, to climbing where I'll start off with just my poles and then if it gets a little more serious, I'll bring out the Hummingbird, Blue Ice Hummingbird. This is a super uh, lightweight little ice axe. So if I have these two, I can get past most stuff um, in, in the backcountry. Like it has to get really serious before I'm thinking about bringing the Aquilas. And now we're, now we're like business. Now business is happening. We're getting serious. You're basically ready for, for ice climbing. I only rode one line last year. Um, kind of on on where I felt like I really needed to bring bring these and I was happy I did. <laughs> Full confidence with these and then I pair them with latest version of the Auftrib. So I've used a bunch of different climbing plates uh, since I started going into the backcountry and climbing steeper lines in, in deep snow. You know from the verts and through some different ones until I got to the Auftrib. This is the, the saucer version. With these ones you put your crampons on first and then you uh, step into it and you strap it onto your, your ski boot. This is a bit more convenient if you're going into some ice, you're going into some rocky sections, you're gonna take them on and off. This is really quick compared to the Cramplifier that I, I normally use. However, it, it is a little bit heavier with all the rope and strings and the ski strap and also doesn't pack down quite as small, like they don't stack up quite as small as as the Cramplifier. But um, I still bring these for, for a lot of days where I'm not sure you know, if I'm gonna have to do some proper uh, climbing or if, you know, it's a little bit of, of deep boot packing and then you're on like a rocky ridge, for example, these are really convenient. When I'm climbing these lines, of course, safety is uh, top, of, top of mind. And on top of my head is my helmet, the Jilbo Peak LT, the pretty lightweight helmet. It's super well ventilated, which I love, which is a pretty like new world for me. I started using this like a year ago or something. I think maybe I even had this in the last gear video, but I love it, it's amazing. And I've always struggled with sweating when I'm climbing lines with a helmet on to the point where I've been eager to not put a helmet on because I know I'll be sweating so much. Uh, with this, that's not a problem. This is so well ventilated that actually if I'm standing still on a really cold day, I'll get cold. So like this is the first helmet where I'm actually like using hood over the helmet a lot if it's getting cold and just layering underneath. But it's super versatile because you can always do that. And then I think it pretty much works for everything. They have little, the little things for um, your headlamp here. You have a strap in the back to connect your goggles. And these are the Topside Boys uh, goggles that we made. Uh, me, Krista and Jonas. You, Jilbo asked if we wanted a signature model. We were like, yes, we do. Um, please give it to us. 
And I've had some comments about the whole boys thing. And I mean, I am a boy, like my gender is male. Uh, so is the gender of the other guys. We aren't exclusive, like it's not a gender thing. Like anyone can get the goggles. I've had girls buy the goggles. Anyone can wear the goggles. Any gender is welcome in the mountains, but we happen to be the male gender. And so they're called the Topside Boys goggles. They are cool, I like the design. But they also have some pretty nice features. They have the zero to four lens, which is, as you can tell, uh, completely clear now. And then when you take it outside in the sunlight, it reacts to UV light, so it'll adjust to however much UV light is out in any given day. So on a cloudy day, brighter, full sun on a glacier, it'll get darker. And it works really, really well. I only use this goggle from anything from night skiing to you know a full bright day on, on a glacier. Not this exact goggle, but these lenses at least. I love the series. I love the other models too. And as well as uh, the lens, which is amazing. Uh, they don't have an issue with fogging. Julba has been great at fogging uh, and all the goggles I've used, but these are even greater because they have the super flow system. So you can pop the goggle out like that and then you get yeah, crazy airflow actually. And it is, this feature is, is really nice, especially on shoots when you're doing little laps, say you're doing like hundred vert and you don't want to take your gear off in between laps. Just keep them on, pop them out, and you can just keep your goggle on all day. And another uh, amazing thing with this, actually, if you're crashing. So I crash a lot, I know. You don't have to keep going on about it in comments. So if it's wet on the inside, I'll just pop it out and it'll ventilate and all the moisture will just escape the goggle. Normally it'll be fine by the time I get to, to the top of my run or my hit or whatever I'm doing. So it's a super good feature. I also use the density shades. And it's kind of actually random which uh, Jilbo shades I use. I find them all to be pretty good, but they sent me these and I, and I love them. I find one requirement I have in the mountains is, is just having something that, again, has good airflow when I'm skinning up so that if I'm sweating, it doesn't like go into the, the shades too much. I find that some of the models that are kind of like enclosed, they can sort of get foggy or I can sweat onto them and I don't see anything. With these I can, again, the photochromatic lens it's amazing, adapts to a light. So yeah, been super happy with these. Used them most last year and I'll keep using them this year. The reason you wear a helmet when going up, cool bars, big faces, things like that, is one is for rock fall. So something coming from above, you're protected. The other is actually in an avalanche. You're so much better off with a helmet on. I know people who've been in avalanches without helmets and they've been really fucked, so. Um, yeah, bur burial is not the only, only danger out there. It's like impact as well. But burials is a real danger. And I have a new tool this year. I've been using this Arva Axe shovel now. And this is really cool. I always go for a big shovel, a big metal shovel, something that I know will hold up. Having a shovel break on you when trying to dig out a buddy is a nightmare scenario. I haven't dug out a buddy with this shovel, but I have dug out a snow cave which is probably more volume of snow uh, in the digging process. And this is really cool because you can dig like a normal shovel, but you can also pop it out and you have sort of this like hatchet uh, style. Because as you know, if you've done avalanche training, if you are multiple people and you're digging out um, someone who is buried, you won't all be in the front. You'll have like one person in the front really going for it and the rest of you are just trying to get as much snow out of there as possible. Again, haven't dug anyone out, just been training and playing around with it. But like when building the snow cave, this is so efficient. You're just pulling snow like crazy. So a really good tool for, for moving snow around the mountain and it's reliable. That's the key. And the last uh, good snow tool I'm sure I showed you is the snow saw. This is the Tindic. I guess it's like tinned equipment, uh, tinned this peak in Norwegian. It is really nice for building pits. If you're doing a 90 by 30 ECT, this is uh, one meter. So it's, you just put it on there, even have the measurement on it. And it's so efficient to build pits. So anytime I'm going out where we're, I know we'll be digging a lot of pits, doing a lot of snow assessment, I'll bring this because yeah, it just makes it so much faster to, to get those pits done. So if you're doing multiple aspects in a day, for example, this really helps. Also, you, you don't have to bring all the segments. Like if you're weight, concerned about weight on a trip, you can just take one off and boom, mini version. 
also a climbing harness um, using Blue Ice. It's a brand out of Chamonix and they're, I mean, they have features that work for the kind of, you know, skiing, mountaineering, free ride, backcountry skiing that, that I like. This is the, the Shukas Pro. It's really, really lightweight, packs down really small, but still has all the, the features you need to, to be out there. You can put gear on it. And also it's, it's not like crazy uncomfortable. Like this is a lot more comfortable than rappelling off a sling. So like if you're gonna be doing a few rappels, for example, this is, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. It's like, these are big enough for you not to be hurting too bad. I mean, I wouldn't go big wall climbing in this, but it's more than enough for, for the mountain in winter when the primary goal is uh, skiing. And it's also packs down so light that I don't think about bringing it, you know, if we're just rappelling uh, a little bit into a line or just being belayed, secured into a line to check the snow, for example. Uh, it's so lightweight that I don't think twice about putting it in my backpack. And with the harness, of course, you use a rope. I feel like this has become like a standard in, in the ski world, winter ski world. Um, this is the Radline from Petzl. Not sponsored, I bought it because it's a great rope. It's lightweight, it works for glacier travel, it works for rappelling. You don't really wanna be climbing with this. It is a static rope, but if you're in a pinch, you can use it for that too. Yeah, a good tool if you wanna get extreme. Or if you just don't want to get extreme, you just want to check the snow. What I try to do most of the time is stay out of avalanche train. And then before going avalanche train, knowing that that avalanche train is safe, the way we do that a lot of the time is we bring a rope, we bring a harness, send one guy into, or one girl, into the avalanche train tied into the rope so that you can check the snow without actually, you know, being in danger of uh, going down with anything that goes down if there is to be an avalanche. It's actually a really good tool for, for many, many days out in the backcountry, even if you're not doing some crazy Chamonix shit. And then a big, big change this year. I'm now wearing Black Rose for everything from base layers to mid layers to insulation to shells. To shells. You'll notice the audio quality just kind of went to shit. Uh, I put the mic inside the collar of this shell jacket. Sorry about that. It'll get back to normal in a few minutes. Which is a, a big change. I rode Northern Lap for 12 years. Now I'm riding Black Rose um, and I'm very excited about that. And of course, you're right, this is partly about sponsorship. I am, a, I mean, it's all about sponsorship. I am a sponsored athlete. You sign contracts for multiple years of working together. The way I do it is that every time a contract period is up, I go like, hey, here's what I do. Here's what I want to do the next few years and then all the brands that are interested or are like bidding on that, on the project that is my skiing and these videos that I produce. And then I make a decision based on, of course, the, the money, but also what is the brand like? What are the products like? Is this something that I can use on the mountain? Um, is this a, an image? Do I like the style of this whole thing? Do I like the marketing? Do I like the people? And all of this combined together to me now writing Black Rose, which was an easy choice. For, for many reasons, I know the guys, I know the founders, Bruno and Camille, they're friends of mine, Christoph, Flo. It's like, I mean, they're all, they're all my friends. I mean, a lot of the people working in the company and I've already skied the skis for, I don't know, eight years. So I know them really well and I know the product and I know that they're 100% focused on what I'm focused on, the type of skiing I'm focused on and just skiing specifically, both, you know, the act of skiing, but also the whole culture around it, you know, ski culture. And I love, you know, the movies we produce together and the music festivals and just everything. It's fun, you know? The, the motto is literally the pursuit of pleasure. And that really appealed to me. And of course, yes, there is a money side to it too. This isn't cheap. I'm working with Vesla, I'm working with Jonas, I'm working with Charlie. I have a team creating these videos for you guys. That's not free, but do you know I had offers for more money? from other brands and I've chosen Black Rose because I love Black Rose and because these products are sick. Look at me. Best dress, I'm, on the I'm actually feeling really good. Yeah, I'm really hyped about it. This is the Aura Explore. It has all the features you would expect from a classic freeride outfit. It has hand gaiters, big puffs you can open and close, but look at, see, this is fun. This is fun, I like this. There's a funny quote. The food looks amazing. It has uh, key card pockets, lots of other pockets, big pockets. It has venting. 
with a little thing so it doesn't go up too wide and you look goofy. It opens from the bottom. When uh, skinning, I usually like to open them from the bottom a little bit so you get less restriction of your movement. I haven't done this on this yet. It actually restricts my movement very little. It has a big hood that fits over a helmet, which is super nice, you know, for taking the lift on stormy days or just ski touring on stormy days or waiting for the filmer to get ready on stormy days or non-stormy days. It goes well with the ventilated helmet, right? And of course, it looks really good. Look good, feel good, ride good. It's x -Pore. It's not Gore-Tex that I've been in for many years. I did some research on that, actually. I was like, can I ever leave Gore-Tex? Is that possible? Little sidebar here to Rainy Chamonix. Just to get you like the backstory, uh, I watched this YouTube vid. It's pretty good. Maybe it's time to forget about what Gore-Tex is supposed to be and talk about what it is. Polytetraflora ethylene. And what happened essentially is that the original Gore patent, it expired in the late 90s. And so in essence, like anyone could make the real Gore-Tex after that. But that original patent happened to be super poisonous, like super bad for nature, you know, made up of those forever chemicals. The reason that, I mean, one of the reasons that we can't eat halibut that's over 100 kilos right now. And so after that, when all of these membrane manufacturers were trying to make a non-harmful membrane, the playing field was kind of level because everyone was starting from scratch. So Gore switched to making membranes from expanded polyethylene and polyurethane. Ironically, both chemicals that were long in use by other membrane manufacturers trying to circumvent Gore-Tex's predatory PTFE patent. It's poetry. And I mean, I skied in that new Gore-Tex, like some of the late Norina products was this new non-harmful PF. C free Gore Tex, and uh, I'd say it worked, but so does all these other membranes. Testing, testing, heavy snow, it's working. A really good comparison is actually the EVs. Like when the first Tesla came out, that was the only EV you could drive and have like anything resembling a normal experience of driving a car. But now, 10 years later, there's plenty of other people making great EVs. And I mean, Tesla is still good, it's still a great car, but I prefer driving a Polestar. Same with outerwear, like. I love Gore-Tex, Gore-Tex was great, but x is also great. And it works, but it, it is also toxin-free, it's PFC-free. It's nice to be in something where you feel like you're not actively screwing the earth to enjoy the wonders of the earth. It has a snow skirt that I've taken off because you don't need a snow skirt when you have a nice big bib. I love a bib for ski touring, for riding the resort, for anything really. I don't really like belts as much because I feel like it hugs my hips too much and I'm not as free and joyful and moving as uh, I like to be. So I love the bib and you know, you don't get any snow in there. Um, it still has big ventilation on the side. If you get too steamy going up, it has reinforced um, legs so you don't cut up your pants with your ski boots. I mean, these have held up really well for all the skiing I've done so far. It has gaiters for your ski boots, of course. Yeah, loads of pockets for all your gear. I keep my transceiver in here. I know you're not technically supposed to, but I like doing that. Don't tell my mom, or you can tell my mom, she doesn't know where you're supposed to keep your transceiver. But um, yeah, uh, an amazing pant, and I'm really happy with it. Really, yeah, it doesn't hinder my movement at all, and it's. It's kind of anything uh, you'd expect from a free ride piece of uh, outerwear. So I'm really stoked on that. And then you have the touring kit. This is the Freebird export. You got it, like the skis, Freebird touring, yes. This is uh, also the export fabric. Uh, so it's uh, breathable, waterproof, works for all that, but it has a less heavy duty face fabric and the whole construction is more minimalistic. So it's uh, more lightweight and just easier to bring into the backcountry. It has, still has pockets, room for your key card. It still has vent, goggle wipe with a little map of Chamonix. Nice big hood. It does not have hand gaiters, just has a little elastic style, uh, which works well. It does have gaiters for your boots though. Essential for uh, keeping snow out. It doesn't have a snow skirt. It's a regular pant, which also works. I mean, I gotta say I prefer the bib. So I've actually been using the bib quite a lot. 
um, even touring. Uh, but this is more lightweight, so like going for longer missions, I would definitely choose this Freebird style setup. And then no matter if I'm wearing the Freebird or the Aura, I'll always start my layering with the Merino wool base layer. Wool is for sure the best out there. I know some people prefer synthetics, they say it wicks away moisture uh, better, but I just find that wool stays warm even if it does get wet. And to me, it doesn't really hold the moisture at all. So I find that Merino is for sure uh, the way to go. And then on top of that, I have this Alpha Hybrid jacket. And this is a super nice insulation piece, mid-layer. It's got this really, really warm PolarTech uh, Alpha, fluffy, duffy, really nice insulation fabric on the inside for those areas you really want to keep warm. So essentially, just the torso and your head, whereas the arms are don't have the alpha. It also has this like wind weather resistant ish -y layer here on like the most exposed parts, whereas the back and the arms have a more breathable fabric. Because when you're touring and you're wearing a backpack, you don't really need that weather protection where the backpack is. And what you're actually most in need of is something to let as much moisture go away as quickly as possible, because of course you have the backpack pressing against you. And then if it gets really cold, in that backpack, I have the Aura Micro Down Jacket, which is sort of that insulation piece, which always is in my backpack when ski touring, at the resort, whenever I just need something to add that little, little extra layer of, of heat. You know, if you're waiting or having a snack or, or if it's just a really, really cold day, it packs down tiny. It's uh, lightweight, it has a nice hood. <laughs> And the down is RDS, which is the responsible down standard. So you know that no animals were mistreated in the creation of this jacket. And then if it gets really, really cold, I have the Freebird Expa down jacket, which I assume is like expedition because this is what I bring, you know, glacier camping or going to the bar in the Arctic here in Tromsø, anywhere where you just want to stay as warm and snugly as possible, even when not moving. Like this is way too warm if I'm moving at all. Uh, I won't be using this unless it's like super duper South Pole cold. But um, this is like, yeah, that jacket you bring for when you wanna like sit in the snow and be comfortable even when you're not moving around. And then I'll pack all this down into the Dorsa 27. This is like my everyday ski pack that I'll use most days on the mountain, most days ski touring. I was going into a cool R the other day and you know, bringing crampons, bringing the house trim, the plates, all your avalanche kit, of course, layering. It fits, fits everything you need for a normal day of ski touring. And it has all the nice features, of course, like a nice carrying system to feels good on the body. It opens from the top, the roll top, access everything from here, but then you can also access everything from the side. So like I know in some packs, it's like really hard to get to your stuff, but that's not an issue here. And then you have a separate compartment actually where you can have all your avalanche kit so that it's re really easy to get to that when, when you need it fast. And also actually that's nice just because you know when you use your shovel, if you're making a snow pit, just check in the snow when you're working in the snow, it's nice to just keep that in a separate compartment so you don't bring all that snow on your gear in with all your other stuff. You don't make all that stuff full of, full of snow. It has a carrying system so you can have your skis uh, in an A-frame but also diagonally attachment for double ice axis when you want to get extreme. Yeah, pretty much all the, the features that you need in, in a backpack. And of course, yeah, you can have an extra room here for your goggle or whatever, if you want to keep a little goggle pocket there and another compartment here on the side and loads of compartments on the inside. And then you can roll it up like this if it's really full. So like you can just get as much stuff in there as possible, but you can also pack it down like this if you have less stuff. It's nice, it's really flexible and it works for most of your skiing skiing needs. And it's interesting too with the sizing, like this is a 27 liter, but I've found that I could fit as much stuff into this one as I've been fitting into what I've been using before, which is uh, 35. So I find that like the volume metrics on these packs is kind of like how on the ski boots you have the flexes that are just all over the place. Every boot is at 130. So a 130 is not a 130 and a 27 liter is not the same with, among different brands. Yeah, but I'm really stoked about it. And for like my everyday ski pack, this works amazingly. And then if I'm going like for a bigger mission where I'm bringing, you know, maybe loads of ropes or I'm staying overnight in a snow cave or something, I'll bring the Dorsa 37, which essentially has all the same features, but more space. And it also has an extra, which I really love, 
helmet net, which is really nice. So you don't have to put that helmet inside your backpack. Of course, you don't have to do that anyway, so you can just strap it on in one of the multiple straps on the 27. But it's, yeah, it's easy to use and gives you a bit more versatility. So really happy, happy with these. And now we've done top, we're gonna end up at the boots. But uh, I'm actually still figuring out my boots. And a month later editing this, I'm still figuring out my boots. It turns out that's quite a process uh, to find the perfect boot, you know, a lightweight, high performing, durable uh, boot. So I'm still working on that. I'll get back to you about it. Um, the rest of the gear is all linked in the description. And um, yeah, hope you guys have a good winter. Shoot any questions you have in the comments and I'll, uh, I'll get back to you.